Uh, if this is your first time here, welcome. We are so glad that you're here. Uh, we have been in a series called Good Church, Bad Church, going through the book of Revelation. Uh, today we're taking uh, a pause on that. Next week, God's willing, we are continuing uh, talking about the church in Philadelphia. Uh, but today we are taking a pause and we're going to talk a little bit about who we are as a church. What's our identity? What is the thing we are aiming for? You know, you heard me mention Fred and Sarah uh, several times. And uh, when we were at their place having dinner, um, they uh, told us the first person who called Harvest a cult. Right? You know, several times. We have been called several things in the community. Some good, some not so good. You know? But the first person that called this church a cult, you'll never guess who it was. Make a guess, anybody. Make a guess. Who think was the first person that called Harvest a cult in Beautiful by Nature, TCI? Let me give you a hint. It's somebody who's in church now. It's somebody who's from Canada. <laughs> Not Diane. <laughs> but it's almost a twin, right? They come together, right? It's Diane, Leanne, you know, and then Quinton kind of comes by the side, you know? Remember when Fred was telling his story, how he said that, 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 that Leanne wasn't convinced this was real. You know, she, she was like, no, 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 no. Something, something is a bit off here. Yeah. That was the love of Christ. And you saw several pictures of uh, Leanne getting baptized. And for the last uh, decade and a half, she's been not just a member of this church, but she's been uh, contributing She's the connection lady. She's always meeting and loving people. But who are we as a church? Who do we want to be? Uh, as I think of that question and, and as I think of uh, 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 how should we present that, uh, a few passages come to mind. Uh, the first one is Matthew twenty-two thirty-four, 34. And I want you to go there. And then I want you to go to John 13, 34, and then put a marker in John, and then come back to Matthew. Because we want to talk a little bit of our identity. Who are we? Who do we want to be? Uh, some of you have heard this before, so this is a reminder of who we are. For some of you, this, you're going to hear this for the first time. But we want to be a people who love without condition. A people who love without condition. We want to be known by the thing that Jesus said we should be known by, and that is love. And he said it, and we're going to see it in the text that we're going to read. We want to be a, a people who love without condition, because uh, uh, love is the thing that Jesus most talked about. 51 times in his teaching ministry, Jesus taught about love. We want to be defined by love. Look at what Matthew 22, 34 says. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. These aren't an ordinary people. Pharisees were teachers of the law. These were uh, men whose lives were dedicated to studying the Old Testament, our Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. They were scholars and theologians in that sense. They knew the, uh, the Hebrew law like the back of their hand. And they came to Jesus and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Uh, that should alert us to the fact that, that this isn't a genuine question. You know, sometimes uh, people ask questions and they really want an answer. Sometimes they ask a question, but they're not looking for a real answer. They're looking to, uh, to promote an agenda or to win an argument. So this lawyer, this, this Pharisee, this student of, of the Bible, this, this theologian, he comes to Jesus and he says, Teacher, First question last night at our quiz was, what does rabbi mean? Teacher, right? He's calling him rabbi. He comes to him and he says, teacher, which is the greatest, which is the great commandment in the law? Trick question. 
there were over 600 commandments. And these Pharisees would spend time just debating, just having discussion and arguments about which one was greatest. Look at Jesus' response in verse 37. And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. In another section of scripture, one of them said, well, who's my neighbor? Who should I be loving? And then Jesus tells the story of the Samaritan. On these two commandments, verse 40, on these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. And when Jesus says all the law and the prophets, he's really saying everything in the Old Testament for us, everything in the Hebrew Bible, the law, which is the first five books, of um, our Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. That's the law. And then the prophets, all the other books. He says, listen, uh, these two commandments are the foundation for everything else that you read in Scripture. It's very erroneous for us to think that the God of the Old Testament was somehow wrathful and vengeful. And the God of the New Testament has suddenly cooled. He has suddenly become older and, and more seasoned. And he's sort of become like a grandfather figure. And now he is just like not punishing people. That's a lie, loved ones. He's the same yesterday, today, forever. He's the same. He was a God of love. Because in Genesis it tells us when, when, when the world was in corruption... And men were trying to do a diabolical things. He looked for a man called Abraham, who was worshipping pagan gods. And he called him and he made a covenant with him. And he said, I'm going to love you. I'm going to make you into a great nation. Abraham wasn't even worshipping God at the time. But God initiated. God went and God loved Israel. In their sin, he challenged them. To repent. A few weeks ago, there was a pretty tough message as we were uh, preaching about Thyatira and, and Jezebel and her sinfulness and, and the dangers of compromise. How, how important it is to, to challenge and to remind us to, to repent and to turn away from sin because sin destroys, sin damages. But yet, God's love runs all through the Bible. Now look at what John 13, 34, if you could go there. John 13, 34. Jesus says, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. And by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So this morning we're going to go a little bit fast. This isn't intended to be a super long, just a few points. And number one is this, uh, make love the main thing. Make love the main thing. This is a commandment that Jesus is giving. So it's not just that he's summarizing the law, he's commanding us. This is the, the, the main command for those who follow Jesus. For those of us who follow Jesus as Lord and Savior, this is number one. And a command is an order. It's a, it's a mandatory action to be carried out by those to whom it is given. We can't escape it. We are called to love God and love others. We are commanded to love God and love others. And if we are going to walk as followers of Jesus Christ in this community, we have to love God and love others. Think of the story of Mother Teresa who devoted her entire life to loving and serving the poorest of the poor in India. Once she was asked why she did this and, and, she, and she, re, she responded with, because Jesus says to love one another as I have loved you. Her life exemplified this command. Her life showed that love isn't just an emotion, but it is an intentional action. 
It is an action that we carry out even when it is difficult to do so. Because love doesn't run when it gets tough. And as followers of Jesus Christ, we are called to embrace the priority of love. Uh, in John 13, Jesus was uh, coming to the end of his earthly life. And one of the things he could have done is that he could have commanded his disciples to pray more. And we should. And he did tell them to pray. He could have told them to have more faith. And we need to. He could have told them to engage in spiritual warfare. And we are a part of that. But he gave them a new commandment. To love God and to love others. And we live in a society that often pulls us apart. We're often distracted with so many things. Find it even difficult to love. But yet as followers of Jesus Christ, his command is clear. If we are to be successful at life, we must love God and love others. You could have every achievement that you have ever dreamed. You could work towards everything that you think will bring happiness and it would not. And I'm not the one saying that. Others who have done that have said that. People who have achieved their wildest dreams and they've ended their lives empty. But if you make love priority, if you make love the main thing, your life will be filled and satisfying. But more than that, you would be obeying what Jesus said. Here's the second thing. Taken from John 13, 34, love one another. Uh, we need to unleash the power of love. It was 1 Peter 4, 8 that says, Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Uh, in relationships, the power of love removes all obstacles. Every one of us have um, a difficult relationship. Every one of us probably have been in a difficult relationship. Some of us have probably been the difficult person in a relationship. Don't look at the person next to you now, please. <laughs> Don't give it away. Keep it in your mind. You, know, like, <laughs> you can just look at this side. <laughs> but relationships are tough. Friendships, marriages, parent-child relationships, they are difficult. But love, as someone called it, is relational dynamite because it flattens everything that keeps us in conflict with others. Love removes the obstacles that exist between two persons. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13 4 says, Love is patient and kind, it does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Verse 8, love never ends. When love is present, it conquers selfishness. We don't think of ourselves only. We start thinking about others. We start putting the needs of others before ourselves. But I love this one. Love believes that God is still working. Love is hopeful. Love believes that God is still working on me. God is still working on the other person. And God is still working in this situation even though it feels like he isn't. I want to commend this to us that God is at work. He's at work in us, he's at work in that person we're having conflict with, and he's at work in this situation. And love is strong enough to handle the mess of others. It is. It is strong enough. It is strong enough. Here's the other thing. We need to follow love's example. John 13, 34, Jesus says, just as, I have, just as I have loved you, you also had to love one another. You know, oftentimes, at least happens in my heart, and I hear others say, if I love like this, then people are going to walk all over me. If I love like this, then people are going to use me. But Jesus did, and he died 
but he was raised by the power of the Holy Spirit. And he ascended to the Father, and he's coming again. Loved ones, love wins. Love wins. Because in the moment, it may feel as if you are being used. It may feel as if you are being trampled upon. But keep loving with the love that Christ pours in your heart. Because in the end, love wins. Because Jesus wins in the end. We don't have a better example to follow. Uh, no one, no man, no woman died the death that Jesus died after living the life that Jesus lived and doing the things that Jesus did. No one loved like him. And he's our example of love. What does that look like? Well, it looks like giving people another chance at doing the right thing, especially when they say, I'm sorry, and they really mean it. There's somebody you need to probably give another chance Give another chance at receiving your love. But it's also trusting them when they say, I want to be better. And trusting God is working in their heart. And trusting that God is going to work out this situation. It's not going to be easy. But Jesus fills our heart with love so that we can love others. I want to encourage you if you're here today and bitterness and resentment has plagued your life and you find it hard to forgive and you find it hard to love others even people that you say you love if you find that difficult ask the God of love into your heart ask Jesus into your heart he will soften your heart he will give you the ability to love others to forgive others he will give you the ability to escape resentment and bitterness it is killing people physically. Resentment and bitterness are plaguing people. Give it to Jesus. Give your heart to Jesus. Let him help you to forgive. Let him help you to walk in freedom. And in that same breath, here's the other thing. Let us reject love's substitutes. I talked about last night. We had uh, so much food at our D group fest. And Tanya was there trying to pack it all on the table. And, and it was so much that uh, she had to get a smaller table and, and pack food under the table. And when those guys started to eat, they found that too. The food that was <laughs> hidden under the table. Man, people fished that thing out and pulled that, you know. Food was done. We love food here at the office. Every event has food or cookies or something. And because we love food, we'll never eat fake food. We'll never bring a fake apple to an event. We'll never bring a, a, a fake piece of chicken or some fake vegetables, Reggie, right? <laughs> All right? Fake kale. Well, you know, kale already is fake food. devil's food but that's for another sermon we love real food but here's the thing guys why do we give fake love if we love real food why do we give fake love and why do we receive fake love there's a saying and i find it so powerful the people who love the most are loved the most loved ones don't give fake love and don't receive it what is fake love well simple definition here it is focusing on what the other person is giving to you rather than on what you are giving to them fake love is a taker take 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 grab 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 here are some things we substitute for love sentimentalism warm feelings but no effort love is intentional love is practical and love is action oriented 
but then there's shallowness. Love, when it's easy, when it gets hard, when it gets messy, when it gets tough, people are out. That's not real love. That's shallow love. Thirdly, sweetness. And we all love this. Nice smile, warm hugs, but that's it. Nothing more. That is fake love. And then we have this, what we call selectiveness. I love this one. I love this one. I love this one. But I don't love them. And I won't love the others. And then the other one is a little bit harder because uh, we see people who love to serve others and we think they're doing it out of a heart, out of a motive of love, but they aren't. They're serving, but they aren't loving. It's not reached their heart. There's some other motive there. That's how fake love looks. But the real love, real love, real love listens because it is founded on humility which values others. Real love is gracious because it shows kindness and forgiveness. It seeks peace and reconciliation over division and resentment. Real love believes there is good in others because we are all made in God's image and therefore we possess worthwhile attributes. Real love sacrifices. Though we are made in God's image, sin has marred and corrupted that image. And it takes believing in the death of Jesus to transform us into the people we were created to be. You know what that means sometimes? We have to sacrifice for others until they get it, until they see it, until they feel it, until they experience it. Real love sacrifices. As a church, that's what we want to be known for. That's what we want to be known for. A people who love without condition. And then finally this. Let love define you. Look at what John 13, 35 says. By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Sorry. If you have love for one another. Uh, we used to sing this when I was in school. It's amazing that Jesus is using love as the defining marker for discipleship. Uh, we, of, one of our visions here is to be a place where discipleship takes place. That's why we have 13 discipleship groups or small groups. That's why we have rooted as a sort of pathway to get people into discipleship. That's why we do events where, where people come together so that they can do life on life and they could sharpen each other. But here Jesus is saying that, that love is the thing that should define our discipleship. That when people see how we love each other, when people see how we fight, when people see how we deal with conflict, they would want Jesus more. They would desire Jesus. Because love would be the thing that defines us. I love this saying that someone wrote. He says, love is the greatest thing. God the Father said so. Jesus the Son modeled it and the Holy Spirit is prompting us toward it. Love is the greatest thing. It softens anger, silences criticism and gossip. It reaches across the chasm of hurt and misunderstanding. It brings hope to the weary. It keeps giving, even when no one notices or thanks us. Love keeps going even when the end is not in sight. Love keeps growing in the heart of everyone who believes that God's way is best. Keep loving, guys. Keep loving. Keep asking God to help you to love, especially those who are unlovable, especially those who are hard to love. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you to continue to love. Let's pray.